And let's turn tonight to Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, and let's start at verse 36, Jeremiah 32, and we're going to start at verse 36. And now therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, Whereof ye say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness tonight. We thank you for your book. Lord, we pray that you bless. We pray that your spirit, Lord, would work freely. And, uh, and Lord, we just pray that we hear your voice tonight. Uh, God bless in every detail, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there was a time frame uh, for this passage, and um, there was an immediate fulfillment that would, took that would take place. Look at verse 36. Um, and now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, and he begins to talk about the, uh, the captivity that's coming. And in verse 37, he said, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again into this place. Um, there was an immediate fulfillment that would take place. In other words, um, they were going to go into captivity. And um, in 70 years, Right around there, God was going to bring them back into the land under King Cyrus. So, you know, first, and even as this, this passage was written, you know, they were anticipating uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So there would be Nebuchadnezzar, there'd be Belshazzar, there'd be Darius, and then Cyrus would be the king that would open the floodgates for the children of Israel to come back and rebuild Jerusalem. So there was an immediate fulfillment to this passage, but obviously there had to be a far future fulfillment. And often you'll see that in the prophets. You'll see the prophets prophesying something and, and it, it did pertain to something that was coming shortly. But then as you keep reading a lot of those passages, all of a sudden something changes in the passage and all of a sudden it launches you know, into the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, there had to be a future fulfillment. And you see that in verse 38, 39, and 40. Look at it again. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. That did not occur immediately. That did not occur <clears throat> that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Well, that certainly didn't happen. So uh, there is a far future fulfillment. The first part of that prophecy was literally fulfilled, and the second part will be also. Mm -hmm. um, God would ultimately, eventually, do a great work in the hearts of the people of Israel. But having said that, there is an application for us 
here. And, and I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy three, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How, how much of the Bible is profitable for, for doctrine, reproof, for correct, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? All of it, all of it. Um, you know, um, not all the scripture is necessarily written directly to us, but it is all for us. Okay. Um, look with me at 1 Corinthians 10 for a moment. First Corinthians 10. Verse one, it says, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Those events that had happened so long before, um, they were then and now our example. So when Paul writes this, it, it was 1,500 years later. 1,500 years from the time that all those events had taken place. And here we are, 3,500 years later, and these things are our examples. Uh, so it's just as valid for us as it was then. Um, look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You know, back months ago, uh, quite a number of months ago, we were in the book of Colossians and we hit uh, that verse in Colossians where Paul says unto him was given the dispensation of the grace of God. And uh, we talked about that. And, um, you know, it's it's very obvious from the scripture that that God did different things at different times. Um the problem is, of course, um, with anything, there's extremes. And uh, you've got, there's some folks out there that would teach you. There's some online guys, and some of them, some of them really, you know, some of them got some pretty good stuff. But some of those guys, they really become extremists in this particular, what we're talking about tonight. And they get to the point where they feel like that really all you can draw from is the the 13 books of Paul. Because, you know, that's church age. That's written for us. I had a friend of mine um, quite a number of years ago, and he was he was a missionary on deputation, and he's at this church, and um, and he, um, he preached out of 1 John. And if you know anything about the people that are very, very ultra dispensational, uh, they don't believe First John is for us. They believe that's totally a tribulation book. And uh, so my friend who got up, preached, and was a very able preacher and, and uh, no doubt did a tremendous job. And uh, he got done, and the preacher got up right behind him um, and said, now oh, that was a really good message. But we all know that First John is not for us. So, you know, he just sort of canceled out the whole message. The, the problem with all that is this. You know, everybody has uh, maybe, you know, not everybody – Divides everything exactly the same. Uh, there are some very obvious differences. Uh, we talked about all that. 
But regardless of all that, all Scripture is given by inspiration. All of it is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Man, you can, it doesn't matter where you open this book. You know, we've been in Deuteronomy, and technically that's that's the one of the five books of the law. And, and yet in that, man, it, there's just all sorts of spiritual applications there. Um, look at 1 Peter 1, verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, the next few verses are interesting. Of which salvation, our salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. That's interesting. Searching what? These, these prophets were searching. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them didn't signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed. What was revealed to them? That not unto themselves, but unto us. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years later. But unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you. By them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things the angels desire to look into. You know, there are, there are truths that run from one end of the scripture to the other. You know, there, there are things that, that, that have dr dramatically changed. Um, you know, um, if you picked up sticks on the Sabbath day, you know, under the law of Moses, you were a dead man. You know, or at least you were supposed to be. If you had a, you know, we read the passage the other night. If you had a rebellious son that was stubborn, you were supposed to take him out and stone him to death. And, um, uh, but you know, we, we, don't, we don't do that now. You know, there's so, so many things uh, like that. And yet there are truths that run from one end of the scripture to another. For example, without the shedding of blood is no remission. I mean, that runs from one end of the Bible to the other. You know, the book of Genesis opens up and man sins. And, and you know, even before Abel offers the first offering, um, Adam and Eve sin, they realize they're naked. And what does God do? God clothes them with skins. An innocent animal died. To cover them. And then, of course, Cain and Abel come along and um, and he offers that blood sacrifice. And man, it just moves from there from one in the scripture to the other. Um, in one of my old Bibles, I got noticing as I was reading through my Bible um, systematically and going through the whole thing. And I got noticing how this thing of whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap how it just kept showing up, like in one way or another. Like it just, and it just, I just started seeing it everywhere. So I started cross-referencing and making a list under Galatians chapter six of everywhere I found that principle in the scripture. And uh, it was everywhere. It was there, not in those words, but, but it was everywhere. In our text in Jeremiah 32, 38, you find one of those. Verse 39. The Lord says, And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. God said his people would have one heart and one way. And it would be something he would give them, something he would do in them. And I think it doesn't matter where you look in the scriptures. Um, anybody that followed the Lord, I mean, there were differences. You know, some of them didn't have any written scripture. Job, he had no Bible. Abraham, he had no Bible. And then, you know, you start moving through and eventually they had the books of the law and 
And now all of a sudden we've got, we've got the whole, the whole thing. Um, and yet it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you look, whether it's, you know, Abraham, whether it's uh, Joshua, whether it's David, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Paul and Barnabas or you and me. You know what God has done? He's really given us all one heart and one way. You know, our circumstances differ and our, you know, our lives are different. But when that, that whole thing of what God puts in us, it's always the same. Uh, when it manifests itself, when it's in living color, it's always the same. There's not the, there's not the, the, you know, the sort of Christian and the, the three quarters Christian and the cool dude Christian and the, you know what God said? God says there is no such thing. God says what I put in their heart. God said, I, I, I didn't adjust it for the times. I didn't adjust it because of the fads. I didn't adjust it to fit certain periods in history. God says, when I put something in their heart, it doesn't matter where you look. God said, it'll be one heart and one way. And that's what I want to consider tonight. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, one heart. And we're going to move right along tonight. 2 Corinthians 5, some things I'll dwell on, some things I'm just going to touch on. And this is nothing new. This is terribly basic. But you know, some people get this idea that um, you know Christianity just has several different faces, and you can sort of, you can sort of, you know, um, have your own brand. But it doesn't work that way. God said, if you're living the kind that I gave you. He said, it's one heart and it's one way that they might fear me forever. It's always the same. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Familiar verses. One heart. The heart is the spring. It's that hidden thing down inside of us. It's it's where the motive for this whole thing comes out. It's the fountain. It's where our drive comes from. It comes from our heart. Okay. Second Corinthians 5 verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. Wherefore, because of this, because of this, wherefore we labor. That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. You know, that's part of our heart in these verses. You're going to see several pieces of our, of our heart in these. And, and, and part of it is, the motive is, why, why do we do what we do? I mean, if, if we're on the right side of this thing and it's really about the Lord, what is it? why is it we do what we do? Well, we know he's coming. And whether it be, you know, whether we go to meet him or whether one day we breathe our last breath somewhere, whether we're going to meet him. And we labor that that whether we're still here or we're there, we want to be accepted of him. He's not talking about getting into heaven, but he talks about not being ashamed at his coming. We want to be accepted. We, we want the Lord to smile when he sees us walk through the door and say, praise the Lord. I'm so glad you're home, man. You, uh, you, you live for me. You live for me. Look at verse Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, another part of our heart is uh, that, you know, we, we recognize we recognize that, um, you know, there, there is a real live penalty for the people that do not know the Lord. And God put something in us that there's a real concern for them. Um, we, we want to persuade them. We, we, the motive behind, you know, if, if the motive is right, and the motive can always be wrong, but God says, but I give them one heart. God says, if they got the motive, I gave them. 
he said, it, they'll all have this, the same heart. And the heart is you care, you're concerned, you, you, um, you understand, even though we've never seen it, we know there's a place called hell. It's a place of everlasting burnings where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And uh, it's the blackness of darkness forever. The rich man was tormented in that flame. And we understand that. Um, that's part of our, uh, part of the reason we do what we do is because we know the terror. Well, you know, I've been thinking about it just a little bit here and there. Um, there's so many of the, of the terrorists, you know, in the last little bit that are uh, going out into eternity and um, hordes of them, thousands of them are going out to eternity right now. And, uh, you know, we, we use that quote, um, uh, one of the last services, it was Osama bin Laden that was first given credit for the statement. He said, he said, our enemies love life, but we love death. Now, you know, the problem with that is, and, and you all understand this. Can you imagine, you know, they're in their mind, they die a martyr's death for their religion. They step into paradise. They have uh, 70 or 72 virgins. And um, it's just this place of unbounding pleasure for them forever. Now, the problem with that is and we understand it completely. They, they really believe that. They really do. They believe that. But, you know, when they breathe their last breath, where do they wake up? You talk about being shocked. <laughs> shocked out of your mind. They wake up not in this place of unbounded pleasure. They wake up in terror. And knowing the terror, and it is terror. Knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. Verse 12. For we commend not ourselves again to you. Paul was telling the Corinthians, he said, we're, we're not, he says, we're not trying to convince you that we're the servants of the Lord. We're not trying to do that. But verse 12, we give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you might have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. You know, um, I, I will give them one heart. And part of that thing about the heart is it's really about the heart. It's not about the appearance. You know, Paul says, um, you know, there are people that they, they want to see reports and they want to see numbers and they want to see this show and they want to perform. And Paul says, no. He said, there are people that glory in appearance. But he said, but we glory in the part that no man can see and that God himself knows our heart and he will bless and he will... He will honor our efforts as frail as they be because he knows that our heart is for him. Verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, some people you know, said Paul was crazy. Whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. And other people said they were too serious. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. You know, there's two sides of this thing. There's God and there's you. God and there's you. Verse 14. One heart. For the love of Christ constraineth us. There's something internally that pushes us. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. He said, uh, that's our motive. That's our heart. He said, the love of Christ constraineth us. He loved us. He died for us. And because he died for us, we want to live for him. That's the heart of it. Jeremiah 32, 39 says, I will give them one heart in one way. There's a sense in which real Christianity always looks the same. 
you know, and, and, you know, you, I, I, what I'm, what I mean by that, it always manifests itself the same to the outside world. Um, we all have a different lot in life. We all have different temperaments. You know, some of you are, some of you are happy and bubbly and some of you are very calm and laid back and, and, uh, some of you are energetic and some of you are not. And, and, um, uh, you know, we all have different temperaments. We all have different likes and dislikes. I always think about the people that like licorice. And I think, how can you like licorice? <laughs> I mean, I will eat just about anything. I really, and enjoy it. But there's a few things I'll say, wow, where did that stuff come from? <laughs> my wife, my wife and several of you ladies in here like, um, what's that tea, sweetie? That was yeah, Earl Grey, but the, what's it called? London Fog. The London Fog. And I always says, you know, that stuff smells and tastes like a dirty sock. <laughs> you know, we've all got different likes and dislikes. And if you serve me London Fog at your house, I'll drink it and I won't complain. <laughs> You'll just make me thankful for real tea. Uh, you know, we've all got different likes and dislikes. We've all got different backgrounds. We've all got different abilities. We've all got different spheres of influence. There's people in your world that you know that have become your friends and your co-workers that, you know, the guy across the church will never have access to. The lady across the church will never have access to. God has given you, and, and it's all different. But if you are one of God's people, there is one way. God puts in us one heart and one way. You know, in the book of Acts, repeatedly, it was interesting, um, over and over and over again, you know, the outsiders referring to Christianity, because it wasn't called Christianity then, they called it that way. It looked the same, and it made the same splash everywhere. Paul, at the end of the book of Acts, he's with those, he's in his own hired house, and he's a political prisoner, and but it's a place where he can invite people in, it's sort of under house arrest. And these people come to visit him, and they're they're Jews from from uh, from uh, Rome. And uh, and Paul says, "I want to talk to you about you know why I'm here." And so Paul starts just talking about it a little bit, and they go, "Well, we haven't heard of you, and we 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 really we're curious about this." They said, "Because we know about this sect that everywhere it is spoken against." You know what? It was making the same splash everywhere. You know why? Because it, it had one way. There weren't different varieties. One way. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday and today and forever. And Paul writing to the Romans about the inner life of a Christian said in Romans 8.10, And if Christ be in you. In Psalm 102, David speaks of the heavens, and he said, they shall perish. And then he says to the Lord, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. God gives his people one way. One way. Real Christianity, no matter where it's found, if the Lord is, if they're living out what God put in them, it'll always be one way. And so I want to give you some of those tonight. One of those things that God puts in you that'll be in every Christian is, is faith. Okay. Um, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And you know, you see that all the way back with Abraham. Genesis 15, God speaks to Abraham and said, uh, Abraham, your, your seed is going to be like the stars of heaven. And he goes, but Lord, I'm. I'm an old man. And, 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 and the Lord says, look at the stars. He says, if you can number the stars, he said, you'll know how many children I'm going to give you. He said, your seed's going to be like the stars. And it says, and Abraham believed in the Lord and it was counted to him for righteous. Boy, you see it all the way back there. That thing of God speaks and a man believes, and a man takes God at his word. And suddenly, it affects his whole perspective. It affects his whole life. It changes his journey. 
faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. In 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he said, you know, I'm, I'm glad when you, when you heard the word of God, he said, you received it as it is in truth, the word of God, which worketh effectually in them which believe. You know what God does for all his people everywhere? All of them. Nobody's left out. If you believe what God said, he says, I cause my word to work in you. Every, every person. There's no exception to that. You know, at the Mark 11, the Lord Jesus looked at somebody and he said, have faith in God. In Matthew chapter 9, the Lord Jesus is talking to two blind men and he's about to heal them. And you know what he says to them? He says, believe ye that I am able to do this. In Matthew 13, Jesus comes into Nazareth, which was where he grew up. And, you know, they just didn't have much use for him there. And it says, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. In James 1, it says, Christian, if you need wisdom, ask, but ask in faith. Ask in faith. Nothing wavering. You know what? Part of the way that Christians live, there is one way they live. And man, there's something inside them. They believe in a God they can't see and in a book that tells them about everything they can't see. And they believe they're going to a place they can't see. And they believe in events they've never seen. And they believe in it's faith all the way. It's faith. You know what else God does? There is one way in every believer. And, and, and another way is growth. Growth. Look at 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. Growth. Second Peter 3, verse 18. The last thing Peter says before he disappears off the pages of, of history and off the pages of Scripture, the last thing Peter said, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow. You know, um, um, I realize you can't, you can't look at everybody and you can't you can't always figure out if they're lost or saved and we know why we do that there again knowing therefore the terror of the lord you know we know believers i'm sure many of you in this room you know we know people that are blatantly lost and then we know people that say they're saved and man oh man we're just not sure you know and uh and and we worry about all that because we know what the lord puts in a person when he puts his way in them and, and part of the Lord's way is that they grow. You know, in Acts 18, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they come across Apollos. And Apollos was a zealous convert, but he only knew, uh, you know, the scriptural truth up to the baptism of John. And he hadn't really learned anything beyond that. And it says, they took him unto them and they showed him the way of the Lord more perfectly. And man, Apollos was mighty in the scriptures. And he was ready to learn. And man, they helped him to grow in his knowledge of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 28, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. You know, even Jesus' disciples had to grow. He looked at them and said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. They weren't ready. All oh, the day would come when they were, when they would be. Come to 1 John, and, and John writes to those believers there, and he says, I write unto you, little children, and I write unto you, fathers, and I write unto you, young men. Paul writes to the Hebrews, and he says, for when for the time, as long as they've been saved, he says, for when for the time, ye ought to be teachers. And he said, ye have need that one teach you again. It, they, they hadn't grown. You know, um, God's way is to grow. God's way is this thing never gets stagnant. 
uh, you know, it, you, you, you know, you sometimes may feel like you're stuck somewhere, but if you're, you're trying to walk with the Lord and, and all growth isn't by leaps and bounds. We were talking about this the other day. It was, it was funny. People are, you know, reading through their Bibles and, and, um, and, you know, there's always that temptation to feel like that you're reading, maybe you're trying to read a lot and you just think, am I really doing myself any good? Is this benefiting me? And, um, but you know, today, I think most of you had lunch unless you were fasting. Uh, most of you had lunch today. And, um, I, I already heard rumblings from a few people that lunch was really good at their house. And, um, I know it was good at my house and uh, I have to watch cause my growth tends to be here and that is not where I want to grow. And, um, but you know, you, you had lunch today and you know what you didn't do? You didn't go, you know, can you, one of your kids, Wah! I'm growing. <laughs> you didn't do that. Do you know why? And I heard Brother Colson say this um, years ago. I'm sure probably wasn't original with him, but all true growth is gradual. You're eating. You're feeding on the word of God. You're walking his way. And you know what happens throughout your lifetime? You're growing here a little, there a little. You know, making some progress, making a little headway, taking the next step. And that's God's way. That's God's way. You know, some of these are so simple. I hesitate to bring them up. But, you know, uh, there is one way that God gives. And part of that one way is um, you'll talk about it. You'll talk about it. But when the comforter has come whom I will send it to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness. They're preaching in Acts chapter 5, and and um, and one of them says, you know, he's talking about the cross and the resurrection, and of course he meant in a literal sense, but he said, and we are witnesses. He said, we, we saw it. We are witness, and, and, and you know what? We saw it, and that's why we're telling you about it. We saw it. That madman in Mark chapter 5, he gets saved. I mean, Jesus Christ himself delivers him from the tombs and the chains and the devils and the cutting himself and the crying, and and uh, and the Lord casts out the devils, and he's sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and he said, Lord, I want to go with you. You know what? All through the Lord's ministry, he was always telling people to follow him. But on this occasion, he didn't do that. This guy says, Lord, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, he said, you know what I want you to do? He said, I want you to go home to thy friends and tell them what great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had mercy on thee. John said, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. David in Psalm 66 said, come and hear all ye that fear God. And I will declare what he hath done for my soul. David said, I don't know what he's done for everybody else, but I sure know what he's done for me. And he says, I want to declare it. I want to declare it. I believed, David said, and therefore have I spoken. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You know, I realize you know, we all struggle and we're all work in progress and all that. But, but you know what? God has one way. You look at God's people, didn't matter who they were. You know what they did? They always wanted to talk about what Jesus had done. John Bunyan, the man that wrote Pilgrim's Progress, one of the things that led to his salvation was he was walking down the road one day and there were four ladies from a church. They were all, they, it, was, it was just like Monday or Tuesday or whatever. It was like lunchtime. And they're all sitting on their porch and they were talking about the things of God. And he said, it just grabbed him. It just grabbed him. I'm suspicious of people that they just don't have anything to tell. I realize you can be backslidden. I realize you can have a really poor testimony with somebody and you're afraid to open your mouth because you've been such a poor testimony. I get that. But I, but I, I look back and, and you know, I, I remember, you know, when I got saved and so many of you can tell the same story. I know people, oh, 
It is one of the infallible signs of salvation. Man, you know you're saved and, and, and you know your sins are gone and, and you have peace in your heart. You know, you might not have been in the bars and, and you, you might not have been shooting dope. And, you know, uh, uh, you, know you, you, you might have got saved out of religion or you might have got saved in a Baptist church to a good home and good parents. But there's that moment when Jesus Christ saves your soul and it gives you assurance of eternal life. And you know what comes with that? He has one way. You know, he, he does something so that you'll tell it. So that you'll tell it. <clears throat> Calling on God. Genesis 4, you have Seth, you, and Seth, and then he has a son named Enos. And then began man to call on the Lord. Man goes way back here. And, and you know what? You know what God's way is? He's got a people that love to call on his name. Saul gets saved in Acts chapter 9. And he is, you know, the, the guy that persecuted everybody. He's going to be Paul. But Saul gets saved. And I mean, he's just newly saved. I mean, like literally it's been hours. And God goes to Ananias in a vision and says, Ananias, he says, there is a man that I want you to go see. I have just saved him. And you're going to go and you're going to pray over him. And you're going to put your hands on him. And you're going to give him his sight. And you are going to tell him the next steps on his journey. And, and, um, and Ananias goes, um, Lord, did you, did you say his name was Saul? Lord, uh, we know that guy. Like we terribly know him. So him and God go back and forth. And you know what the Lord said? The Lord said, I'm ad-libbing really big time here. But the Lord said, you know how I know he's mine? Behold, he prayed. Now listen to me. Saul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees before his salvation. You know what the Pharisees did? They prayed all the time. But now he's saved. Now his sins are washed away. You know what all his prayers were before then? Just a vain performance. It was just all saying the right things. And maybe even from the goodness of his heart, maybe he was trying to honor the God he didn't know. But now all of a sudden, See, God has one heart and one way. And now God has put in his heart his way. And you know what the first thing God says about him? Behold, he prayed. He didn't have to get preached into it. He didn't have to have somebody say, okay, now you're, you're supposed to pray now. No, all of a sudden God put something in him and it was as natural as breathing. And he called out to God. God's way, God's way that God has one way and, and, and God's way is gentleness and kindness and compassion and graciousness. You know, Saul was the other end. Saul was the guy that would kill everybody to make converts. You know, and James and John almost joined that club and the Lord stopped them with the Samaritans. The Lord said, hey, you know, we, we, can, we can make some converts here. And, but, but the Lord said, no, 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 no. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. Now, I know some of you are carrying new versions. And in the new versions, in the fine print, it says, when you're, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, except when he's provoked. And except when, you know, somebody really makes him mad. And except when he hasn't had much sleep. And except when he's hangry. And except when he's, did you know there's, there's no exception clause there? The Bible says, a gracious woman retaineth honor. It says about our Lord that they wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. We said it this morning. It says about our Lord, he is full of compassion. What does our Lord tell us? And be ye stern one to, wait a minute. And be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind. I, I've watched Christians, you know, we all have, have we not? And, um, you know, some of them, they're kind, but boy, it's a sort of a cold kind. You know, they're, they're kind, and, uh, but, but boy, they're going to they're gonna hold your feet to the fire, and, and they're going to test you out, and, and, if, and if you don't do it just right, it's not going to stay kind. Our Lord said, be kind one to another. 
For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless. Our high priest is harmless. You know what Jesus told his disciples? Be wise as a serpent and harmless as doves. Harmless as doves, as doves. Did you know there's no such thing as poison doves? There's no such thing as attack doves. <laughs> you need to be careful out in those woods. You never know when you're going to come on the doves. <laughs> There's no such thing as fighting doves or spitting doves or cussing doves. There's cussing parrots, <laughs> not doves. That ye may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God in the midst of without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights of the world. You know, I know Paul and Barnabas had that contention. They, they had that strife there in the book of Acts and it was Acts 15 and they wound up parting ways over it. But, you know, neither one of them was known for a bitter, hate filled spirit. They just hit this bump in the road where they did not agree on a major decision and they couldn't resolve it. And it had to do with who they were going to travel with. They were all going to be in the same, you know, the same thing together. And um, you know what Barnabas's name means? It means the son of consolation. You know how Paul behaved himself? Paul writes, I believe it's to the Thessalonians. And he says, we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. I was reading here a few days ago, and uh, Spurgeon had this to say. He said, um, real prayer, real prayer, cannot come from men whose characters are contrary to the mind of God. He whose character contradicts his prayer has not prayed. His life pleads against his lips. Can we hope for God's blessing while we are cursing God's people? Y'all yeah, think about that. Can we hope for God's blessing while we are cursing God's people? How can a persecutor pray? Saul of Tarsus was evidently full of hate and cruelty. And you know what Saul was seeking to do? He would grab them and try to, you know, he would make them blaspheme. And, and um, Spurgeon said, Saul tried to domineer over their consciences and oppress them for their belief. How then can God hear his prayer? If you have the spirit of hate in you, it nullifies your devotions and makes your prayer to be no prayer. If I go through the world hating my fellow men because they differ from me and determining to force my own doctrines upon, upon others with an iron hand, I cannot lift that hand in prayer. God will hear us when we hear him. He will do our will when we do his will. And in enmity and hatred are so destructive to prayer that till we are free from them, we do not pray. Be at peace with all men or do not talk of prayer. In that day, there were, you know, Spurgeon was a Baptist. But in that day, there were the different Puritan groups and, and there was the Church of England. And of course, Spurgeon was in England. There was him and he was a Baptist. And then there were the dissenters. And the dissenters, many of them were good men. And they had broke out from underneath the uh, Church of England. They didn't like what was going on there. And um, But here's what Spurgeon said about the dissenters in his day. Among dissenters, are there not persons who are obstinate, bullheaded for trifles, hidebound with habit, ferocious for externals, and yet having no spiritual life? Those who have none of the inward and spiritual grace are often the more fierce for the outward things. See, God says, I will give them one heart and one way. God gives them one way. Look at 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2.
you know, if we had time, we could say uh, we could we could talk about how God puts in every real Christian's heart. He gives them eyes for the world to come. And they begin to look for the world to come. They're seeking a country. They feel like they're strangers and pilgrims in this life. And they want to lay up treasures in heaven. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth. You know, we could uh, we could talk about how God puts in them a right fear. And in these verses in Jeremiah, he mentions it twice. God says that they may fear me forever. And, and that word fear means absolutely what it says. It is a key part of the inner life. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. God said, let me be your fear and let me be your dread. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And there is a right fear. And that's God's way. You know, you look at some people and you can tell they're, they're not worried about, they don't seem to be worried about getting chastened. They don't seem to be worried about getting their life cursed. They don't seem to be worried about making a dumb decision that's going to hurt them for the rest. They don't seem to be worried about playing with sin. You know why? The, the transgression of the wicked saith, there is no fear of God before their eyes. But they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord heard it, and a book of remembrance was written for them, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon His name. By the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And man, we could go on and on and on. God puts something in your heart where you know he's your father and you love him and he loves you. But you know, you don't play with him and you don't play with your future. You don't play with eternity because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There is a right fear. But you know what else there is? First Peter 2, verse 2. Ah, verse 1, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. You know, uh, he compares that thing of desire, and that's, that's the thought here is, um, you know, God has one way. You know what God does when God gets a hold of somebody? When God gets a hold of somebody, man, there's a lot of professions and there's a lot of people that say a lot of things. But when God gets a hold of somebody, he gives them one heart and one way. And man, when God gets a hold of them, you know, part of God's way is he gives them a desire. As newborn babes desire. You know, we, we've uh, we've had some babies born in the church and, and um and we've all seen babies and, and you know, the, the baby's sitting there and the baby's comfortable and happy, you know, until he's hungry and he gets hungry real regular. In fact, in fact, that baby's not out of the womb very long at all. And he is looking for mama. I mean, he is ready to eat. You know, it's a natural thing in a healthy baby. They have a desire and it's one of the first things, you know, they, they don't, they don't come out of the womb going, did you read me a bedtime story? They don't come out of the womb going, so did you buy me some designer clothes? They come out of the womb and you see the manifestation of something that's deep in their nature and they're hungry. God says, this is my way. God says, when I get a hold of somebody's heart, he said, there will be desire. And you say, well, pastor, that's not saying they will desire. It's, it looks like an instruction to desire. Um, it is, but he is not telling you to create this. He's not saying, okay, now, now okay, you just got saved. So now you, you need to convince yourself that you need this. No, that's not what he's saying. He's comparing that desire to a newborn baby. And that desire will be there. But he says, that desire, he says, feed that flame encourage it, make room for it, enjoy it, pay attention to it. Proverbs 18, 1, through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. You know, I remember those early days of being saved. And, and then, uh, you know, I got saved when I was 18. And then, um, you know, I met Mitzi a year or two later. And, and then we got married a little bit after that. And, and man, we were, we were young and we were young in the Lord. And, um, and you know what I remember? We couldn't get enough. <laughs> we just couldn't get enough. 
They say they're special meetings at such such a place. And this guy said, this guy, he gave the guy's name. He said, so-and-so is preaching at, at this church about a half hour away. I said, who is that? And he says, he, he's really good. And I said, okay, let's go. And man, we were just, and, and we'd go, and we'd listen to him. And somebody said, oh, so-and-so is in town. And we'd go, and we'd go. I remember one time, uh, Mitzi and I, there was a, a camp meeting going on, and it was like uh, two or three hours from where we lived, and we didn't have the money to get there. And I had a, a, a big blue, really pretty Caprice Classic, sort of a luxury car. And uh, I had that thing, and it had wire wheels on it. You know what? We were crazy. We couldn't get enough. I thought, how am I going to get the gas money to get that meat? Now, I was working, but I was working for pennies. And I thought, they got pawn shops around here. I took my wire wheels. I sold them for 60 bucks. Then my car looked like a clunker. You know what a car looks like when it's riding around without hubcaps on? <laughs> Do you know what? We didn't care. We couldn't get enough. I don't understand people that have no desire. I don't think God does either. I don't think God's done anything in their heart. Because this is his way. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Man, we could talk about praise. You know, a man's way is always to remember and to hold the bad and the negative. I could come up to you tonight, and uh, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm maybe stretching this just a little bit, but I could come up to any of you tonight and say, um, tell me about all the bad things in your life that, that have happened to you. And you know what? It, it wouldn't take you 30 seconds. It wouldn't take you 15 seconds to come up with the first one. And then I should say, tell me about all the good things God has done. You go, um, well, he gave me good lunch today. Um, <laughs> you know what man's way? Man's way. He notices, you know what man does? Man lives in those dark places. Oh, he may smile, but he revisits those unpleasant things in the night. He revisits those unpleasant experiences. But God says, you know, I'm going to save you. I'm going to give you my way. My way is that we remember and celebrate and notice the good. Rejoice in it. Give him the praise. Well, you go back to the book of Joshua, they're going to they're gonna cross the Jordan in the land of Canaan. It's going to be one of the greatest days in their history. And God says, uh, Joshua, I want you to, as you guys go through the middle of the Jordan there, he says, get your big dudes. And he says, he says, have each one grab a big rock. And he says, when you get where you're staying tonight, he said, I want you to make a nice big pile to be 12 stones. He said, I want you to do it. So they get there that night, they get there and they, they, they make this big bunch of stones and and God says, you know what this is for? He said, this is so that the generations to come, when they cross in this place, they're going to look at you and say, what mean these stones? And you're going to say, this is the proof that God led us through the Jordan at flood tide. And he wanted to prove that he was the greatest God of ever. God says, that. I want to pile stones there because they're not going to have any trouble remembering the bad. My way is, let's remember the good. God says, if we have to put a bunch of boulders in the backyard, let's remember the good. God said, that's my way. One heart and one way. I'm about done. But you hear me. A church we attended a few years ago, they had a special meeting and they had this preacher in. And this preacher was known for being very, um, very aggressive, very cantankerous, um, especially in his personal dealings. And he, and he made no bones about it. Uh, he sort of gloried in it. And uh, he sort of he had convinced himself that a lot of it was really spiritual. And, um, and he came to the end of this message he was preaching. And he was talking about how he had handled some situation and it was very confrontational and very rudely confrontational because that was his way. And, um, and here's what he said. 
He said, now, I know what some of you are thinking, he said. He said, I, I, I know what the Bible says. I know what the Bible says. But he said, but I like my way better. You know what? You know what my way did? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on. You know what? You know what my way did? My way put him on a cross. Why would I like my way better? God says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, if you'll let me work in your heart. He said, I'll give you the same way of living that every person from the beginning has ever known. He said, it's my way. And there's one way. Would you look with me at one last verse and we are done. Acts chapter four. Acts chapter four. I will give them one heart and one way. Acts chapter four. That was in the book of Jeremiah that the Lord said that. That was long before Acts chapter four. And you know, it doesn't matter where it shows up. A person living and loving for God, it always looks the same. Acts chapter four. And look at verse 31. Acts chapter four, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. You know what it says? And the multitude, verse 32, were of one heart and one soul. God says, I will give them one way. Don't you love that little chorus we, we learned at camp? Let the Lord have his way in your life every day. There's no peace. There's no joy until the Lord has his way. Place your life in his hand. Rest secure in his plan. Let the Lord let the Lord have his way. God says, you want to live for me? He said, if you're saved, he said, I've already put something in you. I've given you one heart and one way. Let's pray. Lord, bless your people tonight. Lord, help us. That we would see and want your way. And God, you've already given it to us if we're saved. It's already in there. God, help us to recognize it. Lord, there's one way. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. If God has spoken to you tonight, why don't you talk to him? sitting here thinking wow I think I've got stuck on my way you know what if you'll talk to the Lord about that and ask him say Lord I, I want to get off of my way and I want to get back on your way you know what he'll help you in a moment of time he'll forgive you and he'll start his work again you know why because he wants it to be that way in your heart he will help you
Lord, thank you, Father, for what you have done. Lord, all of us tonight that know you, Lord, all that you've done in our hearts. Lord, we've tasted these things. We've experienced them. And Lord, we thank you. Lord, we, we understand them. And God, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Lord, would you help us that those things all might expand greatly? And Lord, that we would not hinder you, Lord. We just let you just work more and more and more in our hearts, Lord, until you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Also, I, I just want to remind you again, uh, man, if you can if you can be a help at Bob's place on this Saturday at 930 in the morning, that'd be great. If you don't know where Bob lives, of course, just come and see him and, and he'll give you his address and all that good stuff. God bless you. You're dismissed.